Hello everybody, it's me, your friendly neighborhood capitalist, and since it's 2016 now, I'd say now is as good a time as ever to look back on 2015 and my favorite games of the year. Yeah, granted, I usually try to do this in December based on the last two times I did this, but I figured it's probably best to wait until the start of the new year because, you know, you never know when one of those little sleeper hits might come out in one of the later weeks of December which has happened quite a few times, actually. I mean, Captain Toad just barely made my list one year because that came out so late, but yeah, better late than never, I guess. Anyway, as always, I will not be doing this list in any particular order since it's hard for me to choose a game that I feel was, was like the best of the year. And this list is based on my own particular gaming experiences of the year. So if you're wondering why a particular game didn't make the list, it's probably because I didn't play it or I just enjoyed a few other games a little bit more. So unfortunately, that means no Bloodborne or Metal Gear Solid 5 or Splatoon or Mario Maker will be on this list, mostly because I didn't have a chance to get them yet. I mean, hell, I just hooked up my PS4 like few weeks ago I mean for the first half of this year I had like no real extra spending money for the second half I had no time to enjoy the things I bought with said money I mean hell I have Rodea like the Sky Soldier still in its wrap and just all these other things that I just bought that I haven't got a chance to play yet but all right enough about that it's time to get to this list but before that let's start things off with some special categories first up Best game I played in 2015 that wasn't released in 2015. And that game is Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. Danganronpa is just an amazing visual novel game. It's like if Phoenix Wright and Jigsaw from the Saw movies got together with Heavy Rain and decided to make like their own little baby monstrosity thing and it was this game it's it's an amazing like thriller interactive story thing it's just so good i don't really want to go too in depth into talking about it you know for fear of spoilers but it is one of the few visual novels that has a element of gameplay attached to it and the characters are really great the story is good it's it's like a little thriller murder mystery thing you have all these students just trapped in the school and the only way to escape is to get away with murder and oh man it's, it's just so good i hadn't been addicted to a game like that in forever but yeah, it's for the Vita. If you don't really feel like shelling out all that money for a Vita, though, you can always buy the PlayStation TV, which is just a small little micro console you can hook up to your TV and it plays Vita and PSP games. I mean, it's only like $50 now, but you can get it for like $20 on a good sale on Amazon or Best Buy. I got mine from Best Buy. And it's really worth the money because there are some gems of Vita games out there just like this one. I mean, yeah, there is an anime too, and while I don't hate the anime, I'd still say play the game because that allows you to have more of a connection with the characters involved in the story. Because yeah, while there's nothing really wrong with the anime, you want the full experience. So I highly recommend this game. It's really good. Danganronpa. Play it. Up next, biggest disappointment of 2015. And unfortunately, this goes to Xenoblade Chronicles X. I don't know. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm a really big fan of the first Xenoblade, well, Xenoblade Chronicles for the Wii. It was really good, you know, just great gameplay, great characters, an amazing story. And I don't know, I just couldn't really get into Xenoblade X for some reason. It just doesn't feel the same. Not to mention the intro is incredibly slow. And granted, I admit I'm not too far into the game and that's because it's really hard for me to get into. Like I have to pretty much force myself to play. But I have heard some people who were kind of disappointed at first but then they turned around on the game at a later point. 
So maybe I just have to get to that point myself and maybe I'll turn around on the game because I don't, I don't know. It's just some, something is off about it. That's all I can pretty much say. The story isn't all that amazing. Sort of the game structure, you can tell they really focused on multiplayer as opposed to making a really complete single player experience. I mean, you know, that's that's all fine and dandy. But if you want to make an MMO, go ahead and make an MMO. Just don't try to, you know, package this as a single player experience when you're tailoring it for, you know, multiplayer and junk like that. It, I mean, I'm going to keep going at it, but for the time being, it's just, it doesn't really live up to its predecessor. And that's sad because it's not a bad game, in the, like not in the slightest. Xenoblade X looks amazing. The music is, is still as good as ever. You know, and the battle system, you know, it's just like from Xenoblade Chronicles and it almost feels better, but it's just something about the game as a whole and the structure. It's just not clicking. But like I said, I'm still going to give it some time and who knows, I might turn around on it because, you know, that does happen to me with some RPGs in the past. So who knows, maybe when I get to this magical point in Xenoblade X that some of my friends were telling me about, I might fall in love with the game then. But for now, I just think it was kind of disappointing, especially since I was really looking forward to it this year. Or last year, rather. But alright, enough about all that. It's time for the list proper. And as always, it's going to be in alphabetical order. First up, Axiom Verge. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Metroidvania games. I love the Metroid series. I love Cave Story. You know, Metroidvanias are just fun in general. I like the sense of exploration you have in them. And that's always just fun and relaxing for me. But in recent years, we've had a real lack of Metroidvanias, what with the two main franchises in this genre sort of being on hiatus, with lack of a better term. I mean, the last M Metroid game we had was Other M, where the story kind of destroyed any value that the gameplay brought to the game. Yeah, the story was that bad if you've never played it. And then you had Konami dragging the carcass of Castlevania into the middle of the street, letting the dogs pick at it, letting cars run over it, and then taking this mutilated mess and putting it into a pachinko machine. Yeah, yeah, real lack of Metroidvanias. So thankfully, here's Axiom Verge. I don't really have much to say about this. It's just overall a really fun experience. It plays like Super Metroid with better controls, of course. I mean, this isn't a SNES game. Though the retro look it carries is nice. The story is pretty basic, but the gameplay is really good. So overall, I'm really enjoying the game. And yeah, I've yet to beat the game, but I'm enjoying myself, I'm exploring every single nook and cranny, and just playing around with the different weapons it has to offer, like that's just so fun. It has some really cool weapons, and like the little glitch aesthetic it has with certain weapons and enemies, and oh man, it's just so neat, it's so neat. But yeah, solid Metroidvania, highly recommend it. Up next on my list, and boy is this kind of a stretch, The Binding of Isaac afterbirth so yeah now, i say this is a technicality because the binding of isaac afterbirth is just an expansion of the binding of isaac rebirth but this expansion adds quite a lot of content that almost makes it seems like you're playing a brand new game which already felt like a brand new game from the original game and it's expansion that made it feel like a brand new game. We are opening so many doors right here, it's ridiculous. But yeah, Afterbirth comes with dozens of new items, uh, new rooms for you to fight your way through, new enemies, new bosses, two new characters, daily challenges that just add a whole new layer of strategy that you need to approach the game with, for some daily challenges at least and a new game mode that 
plays significantly different from the main game mode, which hopefully I'm showing off right here, but yeah, greed mode. But yeah, the addition of greed mode and the daily challenges and just all these new items and stuff, it's adding more life to the game for me. I'm still addicted as always, but the daily challenges are now making me just hop on every day just to see what they have to offer and how well I'm doing compared to other players in the world. I mean, I don't want to brag, but I'm currently in the, you know, top 21.6 percentile. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And just to put this in perspective, now with the expansion added on, I now have 491 hours logged in to this game that released in November of 2014. Let that one sink in. So yeah, like I said, I know it's a bit of a stretch to put the expansion of a game that came out a year ago in you know this list, but it essentially feels like a new game and I've just been playing the ever-loving hell out of it nonstop. Up next, the game with the incredibly long subtitle, Dragon Quest Heroes, The World Tree's Woe, and The Blight Below. Just now realizing that rhymes. Boy, I'm slow. Oh, hey, that rhymed too. Huh, well, what do you know? <gasps> hey! But yeah, Dragon Quest Heroes, I mean, I'm a big fan of Dragon Quest. I mean, I'm essentially one of the, what, 28 fans the series has here in America. I mean, come on, it has to be 28. I mean, why else weren't they localizing some of the games in this series, huh? And I'm a fan of these, you know, hack and slash warriors games. I mean, the amount of time I've put in the Hyrule Warriors should, you know, tell you that. And yeah, this game, it's no different. It just has tons of fan service and neat little things for fans of the Dragon Quest series. The action is really good and fast-paced and frantic, and you feel like a badass when you're just killing all these hordes of enemies. And, I mean, just like Hyrule Warriors, it's a really fun game. And it's a nice little piece of fan service for the fans of the series. But even outside of that, if you don't know anything about Dragon Quest, you can still hop into the game and have fun just hacking and slashing away at the enemies and junk. Plus, this also holds a special place in my heart since it did well enough for Square Enix to be like, you know what, maybe we should localize more of these Dragon Quest games. It seems that there is a bit of a fan base there in America. After they screwed us DQ fans over for so long, it's about time. But yeah, Dragon Quest Heroes, really fun hack and slash, and I'd recommend it even if you aren't a Dragon Quest fan. I mean, Dragon Quest is like Final Fantasy too, in the sense that each game, it doesn't really build off of each other. They're their own separate story. So you're not missing anything if you're jumping into this game without having played any other Dragon Quest game. With that said, I still highly recommend, like, almost every other Dragon Quest game, too, because they're all so good, but, yeah. Up next, Fatal Frame 5, aka Fatal Frame, Maiden of Black Water. Now, I'm not gonna get into the whole thing of how Nintendo of America screwed up the release of this game. I mean, the game's only 11 gigabytes large, and, you know, it has a digital-only release on a system that only has 32 gigs of space. 8 gigabytes if you bought the cheaper version of the system when it was available. Not to mention censoring and removing some costumes in the game, you know, of an M-rated game. You know, not to mention contemplating not even bringing the game over to begin with. But yeah, no, 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 all, all that's a story for another video. But yeah, despite all the things working against its North American release, it finally got here, and boy is it good. But yeah, Fatal Frame, it was one of the big three of survival horrors, you know, with Resident Evil and Silent Hill. And while this series wasn't as big as those two, it still had a really nice sized following, like nice enough for it to keep getting sequels and sequels that were localized. And yeah, this game in particular is my first experience with this series. I mean, I knew of its existence. I just never played any of the games didn't have anything against it i just never got around to playing them 
But yeah, this is my first experience with the Fatal Frame series, and boy, is it good. I mean, it's one of the few, like, horror games that I can say is just really gripped me. Like, I'm actually on edge at certain points of this game. I think that's due to the battle system, too, because you actually use the gamepad as your camera in this game. Because, yeah, with Fatal Frame, uh, the main gimmick with this series is that you use a camera to fight against ghosts. And, yeah, since you have this first-person view through the gamepad, it just really helps with the immersion. The story itself is pretty basic you know, scary game stuff. But the individual plot lines of each chapter is what really sort of pulls you in, and... Yeah. And yeah, this game did have a bit of a rough development cycle. Like, I think the team changed a few times. But I think they came out with a really nice product. And if they actually come out with a Fatal Frame 6, you know, building off of what they've learned working on this game... I think they can make something just simply amazing. You know, and plus, not botching the localization of it could help too. But yeah, if you have the space on your Wii U, I highly recommend downloading this game. Or hell, if you're able to find a cheap external hard drive, go ahead and get that and download the game. Alright, whatever. Fatal Frame 5, amazing, scary game. It's actually scaring me. And considering I'm not phased by too many scary games, I mean, Slender, Five Nights at Freddy's, and The Evil Within do nothing for me. That's saying something. Anyway, up next, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. So yeah, this is an interesting game where you take on the role of a bomb diffuser, and you have a friend guiding you along as the bomb defusal expert meaning you're working hands-on with the bomb, just working on the different modules in place on it to try and stop it from exploding, and your friend has a PDF file supplied by the game's website to guide you through the steps that you need to follow to defuse it. And of course, your friend is not allowed to look at the screen, and you're not allowed to look at the PDF. Unless you're lonely and playing on your own. Yeah. But this is a really really fun multiplayer game and it's one of the few multiplayer games out there where the other players don't need a copy of the game to get involved. I mean the only other one that really pops out to me is like the Jackbox collection, you know, with Fibbage and Quiplash and all those other fun little games in it. But yeah, this is a really fun game. It doesn't matter if you're trying to defuse the bomb or if you're playing the role of the expert Things get really tense and just trying to communicate with one another, like what you're seeing on the bomb and the steps that they need to follow. It can really lead to some fun moments. The game was built for VR, but it can be played on a regular computer. And yeah, it's, it's just really good. And I hope there's an expansion added to it later on or like a Keep Talking Nobody Explodes 2 with different kinds of modules you have to sort of like work with and uh, oh man it's just it's just really fun really really fun and of course the modules you know you have some basic ones where it's like like a little input pad with symbols on them and you have to press the symbols in a proper order to like a little simon says game on one module and then there's even the module that everyone hates the morse code module Morse code was a mistake. But yes, keep talking and nobody explodes. It's a really cool concept and I can't wait to see more from the developers. Up next, Ori and the Blind Forest. So yeah, this is just a really, really just spectacular, beautiful Metroidvania. Oh man, it's just really fun. I enjoyed everything about it. It has the right amount of difficulty. It's just amazing to look at. The music is excellent. The story is great. And it's just a really captivating game. My progress through it is taking forever because I'm just exploring literally every nook and cranny and just like stopping to just 
look at the background and the surroundings and just take everything in. Like this is a game I highly, highly recommend. It's so good. And I mean, you know, I, I didn't cry or anything, but, uh, you know, the, the intro, you know, it, it, it kind of hit me, you know, up, up here, you know, right, right in the fields. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't cry. Nah, nah, I stayed strong. I stayed strong. But still, that intro, damn. But yes, Ori and the Blind Forest, just to reiterate, a beautiful Metroidvania. The gameplay is fun. The environment is just really cool and relaxing to explore. And it has a really captivating story. So what are you waiting for? Go buy it now. So after that, we have The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes. So yeah, Triforce Heroes is one of the very few Zelda games that's meant for multiplayer. And it does multiplayer well, I mean, if you play Four Swords and Four Swords Adventures, you know that the Zelda games actually do lend for some pretty fun multiplayer gameplay. And Triforce Heroes is no different. It's really fun to explore all these different dungeons with your friends. And, you know, this game has the added bonus that Four Swords and Four Swords Adventures didn't have, where you can actually play online with your friends. Well, actually, I think the anniversary edition of Four Swords had this feature, but that's also a version of Four Swords that's not readily available to too many people. And by that, I mean Nintendo only made it available to download a grand total of, what, six days for the 3DS if you missed it when it was available for the DSi for, what, a month? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Triforce Heroes, you can play online with your friends. You can even play with people you don't even know if your friends aren't online. That's a nice little matchmaking system. You just better hope you don't get paired with somebody who's suffering from a lot of lag. But even then, from the few times I played online with random people, I didn't really encounter any lag whatsoever. Also, the game features a special kind of download play, which to the best of my knowledge, is the first of its kind where someone who doesn't own the game can actually download the entire thing to just play with you. And just like the anniversary edition of Four Swords and uh, Four Swords Adventure, this game does have a single player mode, which isn't as good. I mean, I like it, but but I'm a bit of a weird gamer and I sort of like the little challenge that comes with playing Triforce Heroes single player. But the game really shines with multiplayer and the accessibility options that Nintendo added to it what with being able to play online with or without your friends and just the full content download play. It really helps making this game the way it's meant to be played, you know, with multiple people a better possibility than the original Four Swords or even Four Swords Adventures in some regards. But yeah, the multiplayer for this is fun enough for me to consider this a top game of 2015. And even the story is a nice change of pace from standard Zelda fare. It's really lighthearted and funny. I mean, you're trying to save the kingdom from a witch that just wants everybody to dress in ugly clothes. It's not meant to be taken seriously. It's just an all-around fun game. Though I will offer one word of warning for those of you over here in America that might be eyeing this game. The American version of Triforce Heroes does in fact contain memes. You have been warned. Up next on the list, Undertale. Wait, don't, 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 don't. Move your mouse away from the X button. Allow me to explain. But yes, yeah, I'm sure you're all really familiar with by now. Undertale is uh, an RPG that's sort of Earthbound-esque, but it has its own identity. It has an interesting battle system where you're dodging attacks like in the same vein as you would in, say, 
a standard top down shoot 'em up. And it has an interesting gimmick where you can beat the game without killing anyone. For example, just like in Fantasy Life. And by thinking logically about that, that means you could possibly beat the game by killing everyone. You could possibly beat the game by choosing to let some people live and choosing to kill some people. It's logic. But trying not to delve too far into spoiler territory, it has amazing music, really, really funny writing, a really gripping story, and just tons of fun, memorable characters. Is it a perfect game? No. Like, I can honestly say if I was putting the games on this list in order, it probably wouldn't be in my top five for the year, really. But it's definitely in my top ten because it's just a really, really, really good game. You can tell a lot of love and effort was put into it and... It's it's just really good, and I recommend picking it up. It's only $10. But even if that seems like a little too much for you, or you're not sure, you don't want to commit to buying a game if you don't know you'll like it, there is a free demo for it available on its site. And it might be worth going through the demo just to see if this is a game for you. Because, yeah, it's not for everyone, but I really do like it. And just like Axiom Verge... It was essentially a one-man team that made this game. Yeah, there was help from Patreon backers and other concept artists and stuff, but it was essentially a one-man job. And games like this and Axiom Verge can really show you like what can be possible just by yourself. But yeah, Undertale, a, a bit rough around the edges, but an overall really, really, really good game. And don't let the reaction on GameFAQs deter you. This is the same website that had a meltdown when L Block from Tetris won a character contest. This is the same website that then proceeded to have a meltdown when Draven, a character from League of Legends, proceeded to win the next character contest. This is the same website where people were comparing Undertale winning the best game ever tournament to Hitler convincing people to follow him. Yes, they were comparing a video game popularity contest to the Third Reich. This is the same website where users were seriously ponying up money to run ads on Facebook to get people to vote for Final Fantasy VII against Undertale in this same contest. So yeah, while I admit there are some rabid Undertale fans that do overhype the game a bit, compared to some of the haters of the game, they seem kinda logical. And besides, every fan base has a series of fans that are kind of obnoxious. I mean, hell, look at Sonic. There are actually some Sonic fans defending Sonic 06 now and calling Sonic Colors and Sonic Generations the worst games in the series. Let that sink in. But yeah, Undertale, good stuff. At least check out the free demo. After that, Until Dawn. But like Danganronpa from earlier and Undertale, I don't really want to get too much into this for fear of spoiling certain things. But yeah, Until Dawn is like one of those interactive movies, with lack of a better term, like L.A. Noir or Heavy Rain, or even those point-and-click adventure slash choose-your-own-fate games that Telltale makes, like The Walking Dead and The Wolf Among Us, where there is a set narrative, but every choice you make in the game has an effect on the overarching story. And the plot sort of plays like one of those scary movies from the 90s with the big group of teens and everything. But your main goal is to try and get everyone to last through the night alive. Hence the name Until Dawn. They're trying to live until dawn. But yeah, things get really intense in that game. 
It's really high impact and it's just really captivating and immersive. And I can't recommend it enough if you have a PS4. And finally, the last game on my list, Yoshi's Woolly World. Now, I'm not going to go too in-depth to the mindset that I had uh, leading up to this game after having played so many hours of the original Yoshi's Island and being disappointed by Yoshi's New Island. All I can say is that when I started playing this game, like I had a smile immediately on my face. This game is just dripping with charm from every freaking orifice. The yarn aesthetic works amazingly. And like the little touches they add to go along with that aesthetic is amazing. Like you'll actually see signs and arrows being held up with bobby pins. Koopa shells are buttons. Conveyor belts made out of Velcro. There's just so many fun little things added to this game. You can tell the developers had fun developing this. And unlike Yoshi's New Island, it feels like its own new game. Uh, what I mean by that is that Yoshi's New Island sort of tried to emulate what the original Yoshi's Island did. And yeah, it had a few new little gimmicks here and there, like the mega egg and all that junk. But at the end of the day, it just felt like a lifeless clone of the original game this game however it has its own gimmicks it adds enemies that haven't been seen before and the enemies that are staples of the yoshi's island series it puts them in new situations and overall this is just a really spectacular game i'm currently working my way through 100 percenting it and yeah i will say the bonus levels oh man yeah, they are tough. They kept that little staple from the original Yoshi's Island game. Oh man, did they keep that. And the music is just flat out amazing too. I always thought the cave theme from the original Yoshi's Island was the best theme in the series. But I don't know. I mean, this game has a few tracks that kind of rival that to me. But yeah, it's just an excellent, excellent game. Good feel, I mean, at this point, I don't think they can make a flat-out bad game. It's like the worst they can do is good. Because, <laughs> I mean, I really like Wario Land Shake It. Kirby's Epic Yarn was great. I mean, now they have this. On its own, as a whole, this is a really good game. The sense of exploration you have in each level to find the hidden collectibles is, you know, that just adds a layer of replayability to it. Great music. It controls well. All the neat little touches the game adds because of the yarn aesthetic is amazing. And it's just an overall really fun experience. And quite frankly, I think it's impossible to frown while playing this game like you would have to be the most evil person in the world to not even crack a smile with just some of the things in this game it's it's just it's just so good oh uh, man now i want to play some more of it right now uh -huh. so yeah that essentially wraps up my top games of 2015 going over the list one more time we have axiom verge the Binding of Isaac Afterbirth, Dragon Quest Heroes, The World Tree's Woe and the Blight Below, Fatal Frame Maiden of Black Water, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, Ori and the Blind Forest, The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes, Undertale, Until Dawn, and Yoshi's Woolly World. So that wraps up my video. I highly recommend everything on this list. And with 2016 here, I'm looking forward to many a game that's set to release this year. Oh yes, Star Fox Zero, Legend of Zelda Wii U, the new Ratchet and Clank, Mirror's Edge, Deus Ex. Whew, 2016 is going to be a really good year. But alright, I'm out of here. 
let me know down below what games you enjoy playing this, uh, I, I mean, last year, 2015. And I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.